Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I send peace and blessings to the last Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the seal of the messengers to his family, his companions, and all those who call to his way to the Day of Judgment. I greet you with peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Muslims during the Golden Age of Islam, between the 7th and the 17th centuries AD, traveled throughout the planet and had a profound impact upon human relations. And when the Portuguese had finally overcome the Muslims in Al Andalus, in 1492 we find the last stronghold, Granada, falling. They inherited uh, a technology that was a, a combination of the technologies of China and India uh, and ancient Europe and Africa and the world. And it is reported that one of the conquerors known as an explorer, Vasco da Gama, he rounded the Cape of Good Hope uh, in the 15th century and he was seeking a way around southern Africa. It was not surprising uh, that he was able to do this because his boat was um, designed by Muslims and he carried an astrolabe with him and other devices and Morescos were on his boat and he hired a navigator, Ahmed bin Majid. And so he found his way around with Islamic help and reached into the Indian Ocean. And the Arab seafarers were familiar with the Indian Ocean from earliest times. Now historians and geographers are real realizing that not only did they uh, uh, travel the East African coastline, but they went deep into the south. What is reported is that they actually went around the southern part of Africa and they made it into the Cape of Good Hope long before European presence. The first recorded presence uh, of Muslims uh, in the Cape where we actually have written records is coming in in the Western Cape around the 1650s. And uh, in what is now known as Cape Town, the Dutch established uh, a colony on the coastline. In this colony, they brought slaves and political prisoners from India, from Indonesia, from New Guinea, from Malaysia, from Madagascar, and from East and West Africa. And this base of operations um, that the uh, Dutch had developed, um, you could say, or is now known as the mother city of South Africa. And within the Cape itself, there were a number of uh, early Islamic personalities. In these personalities, there was Tuan Matadin, who was a prisoner on Robben Island. There was also uh, Tuan Rahman and Tuan Mahmud, who came from Sumatra in Indonesia. In 1667, they were able to establish a community uh, in an area of Cape Town that is known as Constantia. And by 1694, and especially in April 2nd of 1694, uh, a special personality comes into the Cape region. That is Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar. He arrived as a political prisoner. And he was known to be a very important person within Indonesia and all of the Malaysian lands. He came in with his family and 49 followers. He was related to one of the sultans of Indonesia. He had made pilgrimage to Mecca in 1644. He stayed in Mecca and he became fluent in the Arabic language. He memorized the Quran. He became proficient in uh, uh, Quranic interpretation known as tafsir. He studied the hadiths, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. He studied jurisprudence. Uh, he studied the traditional Islamic sciences. And he became a very important person within the culture of the people of the Cape. He is known um, to have struggled uh, in Indonesia. And it is through his efforts 
that a community starts to develop. And we find, uh, uh, again, a beautiful blending uh, that is happening within cultures that develops the culture of the people of the Cape. The Dutch had used their superior weapons to defeat the Indonesians. They also used division between uh, Amirs and kings and greed, something similar to what happened in Andalusia. Sheikh Yusuf himself resisted colonization. And with 4,000 fighters, he resisted for a long period of time until finally he was captured and exiled to Sri Lanka. From Sri Lanka, he then uh, entered into the Cape. And so uh, he is recognized as a very important uh, personality within uh, South African Muslim culture. He is looked upon as the father uh, of the Muslims within the Cape. In his group, his colony that was set up, uh, were 12 Imams and their wives and their children. And they settled in the mouth of the Erst River. And Sheikh Yusuf of Makassar, Rahimahullah, he was able to rally um, the Muslim slaves to conduct religious uh, services. And he spread Islam to the indigenous Khoi Khoi people who were living in that region. He died in 1699, but he is still known today as the father of the Muslims of the Cape and as a very important figure within Islamic history in Southern Africa. He wrote books in three languages. He wrote in Malay, Boganese, and in Arabic. And his memory is uh, cherished by the people of the Cape and recognized as one of the most important individuals uh, in their history. By 1725, the Cape is now developing. And um, slaves are being brought in, uh, again, from Indonesia, from Madagascar, from East Africa, uh, from different parts of Sri Lanka and India. And it is reported that 3,000 convicts, uh, prisoners of war, were brought in specially to work on the harbor itself. And amongst these prisoners of war are people that they call bandit imams or exiled imams. And these imams uh, work directly with the people. And what they presented for the slaves at that time was an alternative culture. So you could say in a sense that it was a form of resistance. And that's why the authorities called them bandits. Although they were highly religious people, but they were giving an alternative to the alcohol and the adultery and the confusion that was coming within the predominant uh, Dutch culture at the time. These imams conducted special gatherings in private homes, especially those that were owned by freed Muslims. And their resistance became powerful. And many slaves, as, or especially those people who were able to come out of slavery to manumit themselves and were free, entered into Islam. Another important issue uh, happening in the Cape region at the time is that um, wine becomes an important export. And um, the Muslim slaves now did not drink alcohol, but they were involved heavily in education and they preferred not to drink, so they were more sober than the non-Muslim people who were there, uh, who were working in the region. And so large numbers of people accept Islam and um, upward mobility is actually uh, developed through accepting Islam. And the Dutch authorities, although they hated the resistance in the Muslims, they wanted to have Muslims working because they weren't drunk, they were honest people, and they prayed. And that is a benefit for somebody who is controlling uh, an area and needs uh, strong, sober, sustained help. When the British abolished slavery and they freed African people in a number of their colonies, about 5,000 of these Africans came into the region between uh, 1808 and 1856. Uh, they came mainly from Mozambique, and um, when they came into the region, they actually saw Islam as the best alternative for their lives. So they entered into Islam in large numbers, and they bolstered the Muslim community, 
and um, strong madrasas start to develop. So that by the year 1780, individuals are rising up, one of them known as Tuan Guru in the Malaysian language, or Imam Abdullah ibn Qadi Abdus Salam. He uh, uh, comes out, he emerges as the strongest personality at that time. He was banished to Robben Island, the same place where President Nelson Mandela uh, suffered during the apartheid uh, regime. Uh, Tuan Guru was banished to Robben Island, and um, finally, when he came out in 1793, he wrote the Qur'an, the whole Qur'an, from his memory. And this text is still found today in the uh, first mosque uh, that was established in Cape Town. And um, this masjid that was established around 1834 is known as Awal Mosque. And so it is the first mosque to be established uh, in the Cape. The Imam, of course, coming uh, out of the tradition of Tuan Guru uh, and uh, uh, right in line with these teachings, um, helps the people to come into Islam. So what happens is that Tuan Guru and the others who follow him then convert many people, not by force, not by violence, but people come into Islam through education. People see Islam as a means of raising their status in life, as a means of understanding what is happening in the world. And it is reported that those who were still in ball and chain slavery, those who, who could not move around in the evening because of the chains, would get up in the middle of the night and pray to Hajjid prayer with chains. They would get up in the middle of the night and read the Qur'an in chains. This is a powerful part of the history of Muslims living in the Cape. And this is part of the important uh, understanding which is now arising uh, out of the Cape region that shows the connection between Muslims in Southern Africa with Muslims living in East Africa, Madagascar, Malaysia, Indonesia, and we find from the writings and the teachings of the scholars that the Muslims in South Africa in the early period were also connected with uh, the Muslims in Arabia. Their leaders had studied in Mecca. The teachings were coming from traditional uh, Islamic uh, uh, sciences. And the, 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 the culture that develops becomes connected directly to the Muslim world. Let us take a break now and then continue on with our understanding of the Muslims living in the southern part of Africa, in Cape Town. Welcome to this new episode of Focus Point. The new generation is has the good the habit of reading more than before. Jewish question was named basically the problem of Jews who lost their function in society. The Muslims in southern Africa living at the Cape, uh, developed a, a beautiful culture, which was another blending of Islamic cultures 